Welcome to season two of Green Gotham. I'm Lou Blaustein. I want to thank our viewers from season one for your support and for coming back. We hope you enjoy the new campaign. And we've got a real treat for you. Joining us is climate rock star Harriet Sugarman. She's executive director of Climate Mama. She's a climate reality leader and much more. Harriet, welcome to Green Gotham. Thank you so much, Lou. It's really a pleasure to be here with you today. And I'm so, so looking forward to our talk, but I don't want to start here in New York. I don't want to start with Climate Mama. I don't want to start with Climate Reality. I want to go back to the beginning. And for you, that's in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. And to me, there's a delicious irony in that because Edmonton is the home of the tar sands oil. In fact, the hockey team is called the Oilers. So how did you go from Edmonton and oil to climate change in New York? It's true, Lou, it is, a, it is an irony of sorts, but it also keeps me grounded in many ways as well because my family and many friends are still out there in Alberta and I go back regularly. And as you said, it really is like the Texas of Canada. It relies on and is dependent on oil, but that's beginning to change too. But for me, growing up there, I always knew there was a big world out there, and my move from there after college brought me here to New York, to the United Nations, actually. And I was one of the International Monetary Fund, the IMF representatives, to the United Nations. And through that role at the United Nations, I began to follow what was then just the beginning of the climate negotiations and leading into the first Earth Summit, which was in back in 1992. And we at the IMF at that point helped in putting together and much many of the documents that were used for that Earth, first Earth Summit. So I got to be moving from Alberta to a very uh, circuitous route that brought me to a very big stage and the really beginning of the international negotiations and discussions on climate change, what it was all about. We were actually defining what sustainability meant for the UN at that point. So it was really back into the beginning and took me far and a world away from Edmonton at that point. That must have been fascinating because you are in the United Nations. You're defining sustainability and where hopefully the, the, the nations of the world are going to go to solve this problem. Mm -hmm. And then what happens? Not that much. Right. And so how did that make you, how did that make you feel? Right. You know what it was? I spent uh, 13 years at the United Nations, uh, full time, 10 years and three and four years after that with a fun uh, back and forth. And it was fascinating to be on uh, this big stage. And in many ways, though, I came to feel that I was really at a learning place for diplomats, a place where people came to learn how to negotiate and we'd stay up till three and four in the morning negotiating an and or a but or a the or an or and it, it became for me, especially working on environmental issues at that time while I learned a lot and learned how difficult it is to come to agreement when you have over 190 countries coming to... You think? Yeah, yeah I think. <laughs> um, and it it was frustrating personally for me because I felt like we were making very small progress. Uh, I, coming away from it though, I recognize there is a role and an importance and a place to have those higher level agendas and uh, agreements reached, but when you are in the midst of it and going through it, it felt to me, and we've talked about this before, as not much was happening uh, and it really made me jaded a bit about the whole process. But you are at also, as you're doing this decade long and more ex uh, tenure there, you are becoming schooled in climate science and you're becoming schooled in the reality. And then when you would talk with your friends back home and your family back home in Edmonton and Alberta where the oil is flowing, like was, did they get what you were doing and were they supportive? What was that like? 
you know, my family's always been very supportive of what I was doing, but I have to say that back then, back in uh, the early 90s and the mid 90s, when I was attending all of these international conferences that were looking at aspects of climate change, uh, the Habitat for Humanity, the Women's Conference in Beijing, uh, and we were doing these big agenda items, the tar sands wasn't what it is today. It was really, you know, only beginning to evolve and develop in Fort McMurray and Alberta. The oil in Alberta was much more access accessible. It wasn't through tar sands. It was like Saudi Arabian oil. You basically stuck uh, a drill in the ground and oil came out. So really, it's only been you know, the last 10, 15 years that the tar sands have really evolved and developed um, and really much more recently and that it's become financially feasible for those companies to be able to take the oil uh, that way out of the ground. But back then, you're, you know, the, the Albertans, they weren't like, what are you doing? You're, 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 you're ruining our, our business. No, that's come more lately. That's lately. That's, <laughs> that's, lately. that's more lately. So, so, so you get jaded. And so what do you do with your, because inside you also have this knowledge and desire to move the needle. So what do you do to kind of get off the, the jaded dying? Right. Well, you know what? I, personal uh, reasons came into the mix for me. I had two children, and it became very difficult for me to juggle it all. And so it was a good point for me also to say, okay, uh, maybe I'm going to step back from here because it isn't turning out exactly the way that I wanted it to. And then with my children, I was meeting other parents who had small children who really didn't have a clue about climate change, didn't understand what we were doing that was causing things to change, didn't have that connection. And so it was very interesting to be on this very big stage where you're talking and meeting people from all over the world, working at a very high level. And they're living it every day. Every day. And you're talking about it, the issues at a very high level. And here I was then coming down and meeting people at the local level and seeing what was happening and what wasn't happening. Going to my children's nursery school and seeing water bottles piling up over garbage cans and people not making the connection, never mind to recycling, but to the oil that goes into making the shell of that plastic bottle that is being used. And recognizing there here in the United States that there is a lot that needs to be done to help educate people at a very grassroots local level never mind that whole big world that things that are happening internationally but unless we implement what they decide at this big high level on a local level uh, nothing's going to happen. happen so you know we fast forward through the 90s and in the late 90s the Kyoto Accords which were the first big global compact mm -hmm. uh, on climate change re reduction, uh, greenhouse gas emission mm -hmm. reductions, mm -hmm. the U.S. didn't ratify. Right. And, and then we get into the early 2000s and uh, the Bush administration takes over and they become in, in essence hostile to climate change and, mm -hmm. and anything environmental. And so then what do you do as we get towards the middle of the decade? Right, and so for me, something very exciting happened because I was trying to figure out how do I take this? How do I take what I've learned, what I know needs to happen? Because we, the evidence too, also in the early 90s, we didn't have that scientific evidence. We, we talked a lot about it. We knew that things had to change and be done, but really it was in the early 2000s that science started to really show us too. It was showing us, but that we had multiple peer-reviewed studies. Science, yeah, we started coming out with the IPCC, the Interpanel on Climate Change um, reports that were really showing us that where they were very hesitant in the early 90s about saying it is caused by us. Uh, uh, now they're saying it is definitely caused by us. We are doing things that are changing our world and our environment in ways that uh, have to be changed. And it was around that time that Al Gore uh, in the mid-2000s was making his film An Inconvenient Truth and where shortly thereafter he said he was looking for people. He was looking for people to help share that story. And, and so full disclosure, Harriet and I know each other from something called the Climate Reality Project. And that's what Harriet was just referring to is Al Gore's nonprofit. 
that he started in right around the time of an inconvenient truth. Absolutely. With the idea that, okay, he was the former vice president, almost president, speaking from on high. Mm -hmm. He needs people from the grassroots, the you's and the me's of the world, to tell the story, just like he did in the movie, to community groups and build up from the grassroots. So he trains people and has for the better part of a decade to go out and give the slideshow that was the, pre the heart of an inconvenient truth. Harriet, you got involved at an early, early stage with, this, uh, with the training with Al Gore. So talk a little bit about that. I did. It was really thrilling. I was in one of the first cohorts the uh, first year after Mr. Gore decided that he was going to run this training, that he needed to reach more people. It was 2006-2007 and he did a fr the first training, which I wasn't part of, at his farm with about 50 people. That would have been so been cool. Amazing, and I amazing. applied for it and I didn't get it. You got in the first group, that's pretty pretty cool. Right, so I was uh, just, a, uh, it, there were four other trainings that year that were done in Nashville in Tennessee and I was in one of those. They were small groups, we had uh, not 50, but we had 100 to 125 people in each of those groups. and. Yes, and we were figuring it out as we go. He is a big part of the trainings. He comes and spends a day telling you how we put each slide into order, what's happening, why it's like that. The trainings have changed now in the last eight years since When Harriet then. says he spends the day, okay, he spends the day. Mm -hmm. he, he talks to us for eight hours, and it's interesting. Yes, It's it fascinating. Is. And I know you're out there thinking, eight hours, Al Gore, not interesting, <laughs> no. Eight hours, Al Gore, fascinating. Fascinating. Continue. He's so passionate about it. And it was an opportunity to be able to have these amazing, because we had the slides, the original slides from that Inconvenient Truth film, to be able to take them. And of course, I'm not Al Gore, and where people might listen to him for an hour and a half, they're not going to take that same amount of time with each of the individual people that he's trained. But you get this, um, these amazing slides and an incredible resource, because you get him, you get a team of scientists, you get uh, media people that help you then learn how to do this and take it out into your own community. And at that time, it was really about giving the slideshow, which I've given close to a hundred times uh, across the U.S. and Canada. Now it's become more also about acts of leadership. Um, I was the district manager for climate reality in New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania and Delaware, uh, and we've grown since that first thousand people that were trained in the first year uh, to close to 6,000 people around the world now. And we met when I got trained mm -hmm. in 2012 in San Francisco. Yes. And one thing that I noticed, and I'd love to get your take on it, you know, when you saw the movie An Inconvenient Truth, you know, it, and that, and the slides, it was kind of depressing. Mm -hmm. And, but as I've noted with the Climate Reality Project since then, they've really flipped it and made it much more positive in terms of the tone, in terms of the solutions orientation of the climate change problem, solutions to climate change. Speak a little bit more Absolutely. about that. Absolutely, and, and I feel that as I've grown up in the climate movement and as the U.S. climate movement has, has evolved, because it really still needs to get much bigger, but what we started with climate reality where I think people felt that were in the movement that if we just tell the truth, if we just show people what's happening and how bad things are, everybody's going to want to change and oops. do something different. And oops, exactly. And people instead wanted to hide their, you know, shut their eyes and not see that because it was too big, too hard to get your arms around seemingly. And, and that didn't work. Or because they didn't like Al Gore. Or because they didn't like Al Gore. <laughs> I always say he was too. the best thing that ever happened to the fight of, against climate change. And he was the worst thing that ever happened to the fight against climate change because because he's a politician and 50% of the people don't like him, they right. automatically put that bias against whatever he's saying. Right, and I think that climate reality is all of the many thousands of people now that are there and making it their own, both the slideshow and the message, and finding their way to reach their communities. And 
the community that you speak to as well too and then people identify because they want to hear the story from you so as you said that's exactly what's happened we've switched it to focus on yes let's tell the story but let's make it let's tell our own stories and let's look at the positive let's look at all of the wonderful things and the many opportunities that while we live climate change there are incredible opportunities that it presents and that's and we're talking off stage about that's the way to present it mm -hmm. because Every problem has solutions. This is many problems, right? There are many solutions. Mm -hmm. This is for the younger generations coming through. Learn about how to make, learn about the potential solutions, put those into practice. You'll have a job and you'll save humanity in the process pretty good. Pretty good. All right, so you, climate reality, you're doing that, but then you also say to yourself, climate mama and how does that come into being and how do you have time to do it all? Right, well that was a few years later after my training I, I was figuring so how I want to dig deep into this. This is, it was my aha moment as Al Gore talks about but it, w it really was where I felt this is what I want to do. This Which is, one, your aha moment was? Was uh, uh, after the training and saying aha I can impact people's, I, I can help people get this message and they're listening to me and I that must have been so empowering it, it was it, it is empowering I think that it is empowering to actually feel like you are really helping people understand and get this and you never know when you talk to people who is it that actually is going to change the world right who is going to be right. that person that is going to actually move things through change in policy through inventions through whatever it is you never know and that was my learning from being at the UN too that you know you, you meet all these people and and you feel nothing ever happens you never know though who there are that one leader or that one individual that takes what that message and makes it and turns it into something else so I decided I was meeting a lot of, of parents I had these two young children who are now teenagers but at the time I felt like there is an audience that they can relate to me, they can hear my story, hear what I know and will listen to me. I'm going to start Climate Mama. I am going to figure something out uh, both online and offline where I can actually address people and help other parents understand more about climate change but then also to be able to talk to their children about it too, to tell their children that they are empowered, that they are looking as a family and as a community to be able to make a change and make different, a, a difference and that nobody, whether you're dealing with young children like I was at that time or you're dealing with children who are 40 years old uh, and you have grandchildren, how do you relate? So talk a little bit about what that practically has become. I believe you started it in 2009. I did. And, uh, originally, and had you ever started a nonprofit before? I had never. I have never done that before. So it was But you whole, were empowered. I felt empowered and I felt that this was a real opportunity for me and we started with a online website blog and actually we we're going to do product reviews. Uh, initially we, I was working with somebody at the time that and we don't do that anymore but we were going to because there were not and there still isn't you know although there are many green certifications but for kids yes. toys and things around the house uh, I'm working with a great organization called the climate store that's doing that right now actually from Boston but it didn't work for us but so we went through a few different trials and we were doing workshops in schools and churches with businesses also how to green your school your business and uh, it's evolved over the last... And was that last, local New York, New Jersey at that, that was, time? That was local New York, New Jersey, although our website and blog has blossomed and our social media, and we have people that are coming from over 120 countries to the site. We have people from every, you know, all 50 states, and so we were reaching, we were seeing that we were also reaching people. People were telling us their stories, and we were able to share them online and through what we were doing. Over the last few years, I have become much more involved, and in my work with Climate Mom has taken on more of an advocacy role. Uh, I really feel and I think that as we learn more about what's happening specifically with climate change and how we are, you know there are wonderful things happening but we're not moving fast enough that we as individuals have to become our own advocates. We have to lobby Congress, we have to lobby our mayor, we have to lobby our uh, city, council. city council and our community boards and we have to make changes and and I see that that works. That and we so can you're do that. doing that through the prism of Climate Mama, and I'm guessing the other Climate Mamas throughout the 
country I, are doing that as well and then sharing exactly. via the site? We are. We're doing a campaign where we're getting uh, letters to the editor and op-eds in to try to reach more people. We're partnering with a lot more organizations all around the country to work on projects. We're working with a lot of frontline communities now uh, that are on the front lines of uh, drilling and Inf gas and oil infrastructure, and that's a lot of what's happening that out here in the That takes you back to Alberta. It, it, it's come full circle that way, Lou. You're yeah. absolutely right. It, it absolutely has. Because that was in 2007 when w I was trained. It wasn't a reality here in the Northeast. That was when the first wells were being drilled, drilled in Pennsylvania. Fracking uh, wasn't an issue here. Oh, yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's the last seven years, really. It, completely has been and so we have where we were when we even began fighting the against the uh, the pipeline that the keystone that everybody talks about we weren't even really recognizing about how serious all the pipelines that are coming through New Jersey New York Connecticut Massachusetts you know those are serious fights that we need to have too so and that climate mama is involved with could I ask our Climate papas allowed? Absolutely, and, definitely. And yes, you know, climate men who don't have kids. A absolutely, absolutely. No, and we, and that's been so exciting too because we've been working with a lot of community groups, and that that's what's happening too, which is uh, incredible. Is these communities that are on the front lines of these pipeline expansions on compressor stations? People are coming together, and we are starting to see them join up all along the length of one of these big pipelines uh, and come together to do that. So that is the advocacy. That is the saying no part. We're also doing a lot on the positive, on the plus side to move forward, uh, working with legislation in New York and New Jersey um, on the REV, which is here in New York, which is the renewed energy vision for New York yes. State. We're working with New Jersey on uh, putting forward some new guidelines for uh, solar, uh, uh, moving both solar and renewable energy beyond where we are, which now the legislation ends in 2025, so we're looking to expand that. So we work with legislators, we work at, again, different levels of government to try to move things forward through parents and community groups. So this is the antithesis of what you saw at the UN, exactly. right? Exactly. UN was slow moving. Here, you are taking the ball and running with it. Exactly, and, it, and it's very exciting. But you see also it helps, you know, I really see the, it's difficult, even in a country like the United States where you think things would be easier to move, that we see the gridlock nationally. And so things where we still have people denying the reality of climate change. We have over 100 people uh, in elected office at the national level that deny the reality of climate change. That's crazy that is just unacceptable it's dangerous it it's, is, it's literally it's dangerous and that includes all of the announced candidates for president on the Republican side it, and, and, the, it and that's should, a tragedy it is a tragedy because climate change has been politicized and it shouldn't be a partisan issue it isn't it, it doesn't matter if you're red white blue Republican or Democrat a Green Party no party it impacts everyone and it's coming at all of us at the same time and we need to work together and we're seeing that happen more on the local level yes uh, it's become much too politicized on a national level and we need to change that and so we're working to try to change that well that's fantastic now in, in terms of what you're working on now and in the near future mm -hmm. talk about the moral march yes it is very exciting so well we look to world leaders to have a role in moving us forward on climate change. I, I found my way sort of back to the UN because we have big important negotiations coming up in Paris in uh, November and December this year, the follow-up to the Kyoto, where we really need binding uh, agreements by countries. And one of the uh, surprise or maybe not surprise uh, world leaders on the stage is is our Pope is the Pope and the Pope as he's issued, been phenomenal, ph phenomenal 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 on climate change so he is coming actually in September to address a joint session of Congress to talk about climate change he's going to be coming here to New York uh, on September 25th to address the United Nations in the lead-up to these Paris negotiations to talk about climate change and we are working together with other climate reality leaders actually and many many groups uh, on the moral march for climate justice which will take place the main march in New York uh, excuse me in Washington DC on Sunday September 20th and there will be solidarity marches happening 
all over the world, we hope. Uh, that's the plan. And the goal for the march is? It's just actually, the goal for the march itself is to identify climate change as a moral issue. It is a moral issue and one that we all need to address to support what's happening as people come together to recognize that we need to have action. There will be follow-up action. So for example, the next day after the march on the 21st, we'll be going to congressional offices, office of some of those deniers, those, uh, those people that question or are not moving on climate action, and we will be asking them to take action on climate change. And so the march actually is just to galvanize people around the issue of climate change as a, as a climate justice issue, as a, as a moral issue. Uh, and then to start asking and demanding answers and things for Paris to actually be on the books that we actually come up with binding agreements. And it's great that the Pope obviously a moral figure, mm -hmm. is going to be following up the march with his speeches to Congress and then at the UN. Exactly. Uh, we are almost out of time. This has flown by. Wow. Uh, and so I want to get your take, because we've been talking about the local, I want to get your take on President Obama on climate, because I know, especially in the first term, he was not graded well. You know what, he is doing, given the constraints that he has, with a, uh, he's doing really incredible things with the Clean Power Plan. Uh, he's uh, working on the CAFE standards, which are uh, cars and trucks in uh, 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 efficiency. Efficiency. He's doing a lot of things, although I have to say, too, he presents as the all of the above energy policy president, too. And from where I sit and from what I'm learning with the communities that we work with that are on the front lines of fracking and oil and gas development, you can't have it both ways. It's a non-starter. It is. It, it's a non-starter. I mean, I, I can see how he needed to do that to win states like Ohio and, and others, but now he doesn't have to run anymore. I, I, and, yeah. and, you know, but I also think that, especially Obama's second term, he's been mm -hmm. fantastic. But what I really want to do is thank you. First, thank you for all your incredible climate activism. and. You viewers, if you have climate activism stories to share, and I know you do, we would love to hear from you. But Harriet, thank you so much for joining us on Green Gotham. Thank you for having me, Lou. It's been, as I said, truly, truly a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.